continuing now with part two of lecture one on the Oedipus complex, on the universality of the Oedipus complex. Uh, we continue with on the irony in the neo-Freudian critique, Freud's instinct theory. Given Freud's many reiterations of the complemental series from the beginning to the end of his career, it remains an important question for psychoanalysis how Cardner and others could have so frequently misinterpreted the Oedipus complex as if Freud had assumed that special institutional conditions had no bearing on its formation. And that was um, a piece out of that longer quote from Cardner that I had introduced in the last part. But if Cardner had overlooked Freud's emphasis on the role of experience and environment in his controversial Lamarckism, Freud's, only to downplay the significance of it in Freud's many references to the complemental series, he should at least have credited in Freud's instinct theory. The fact that Freud defined the instincts precisely in the context of their relation to environmental determinants can be seen here in his thinking on latency from 1936. Quote, the period of latency is a physiological phenomenon. It can, however, only give rise to a complete interruption of sexual life in cultural organizations, which have made the suppression of infantile sexuality part of their system, end quote. Likewise, Freud's definition of the object in his instinct theory as the most variable attribute of an instinct was central to his understanding of developmental change and adaptation. It specified that the instinctual object is, quote, not originally connected with the instinct, but becomes assigned to it only in consequence of being peculiarly fitted to make satisfaction possible. It may be changed any number of times in the course of the vicissitudes which the instinct undergoes. End quote. This mobile quality of instincts and their relation to objects was a major source of plasticity in Freud's theory of individual development and it was fundamental to his explanatory theory of culture and civilization in Totem and Taboo. It was the basis for the displacement of affect from the primal father onto the sacred totem that allowed for the creation of totemism to begin with. Moreover, it explained the transmissible quality of the phenomenon of taboo in totemic societies where, like an electrical charge or a contagious agent, this mysterious and dangerous power could be transferred so easily from one object to another, like magic spells. This feature of Freud's instinct theory predicted the endless displacements and sublimations according to the influences from the special institutional conditions that Cardner and others accused Freud of neglecting. Now on biological determinism, racism, and eugenics. Once again, an important question arises as to how Freud's Oedipal theory could have been misinterpreted in terms of such a rigid biological determinism. While this problem was most likely multi-determined, I'd like to discuss one particularly important factor that was involved. Certainly a powerful antipathy had developed, especially within American anthropology, toward anything resembling 19th century comparative approaches to cultural evolution, with simplistic biological and racial assumptions. At the time of Cardner's critique, 1939, I'm talking about his publication, The Individual and Society. At the time of Gardner's critique, this was still a powerful obstacle to a fair appraisal of Freud's Oedipal theory, I would propose. A strident ideological, sometimes political campaign on behalf of cultural determinism, 
arose in American anthropology. This had well-determined, I mean, well-reasoned precedents. Going back to Franz Boas's quite heroic opposition to any role for science in the popular eugenics movement during the Progressive Era. era. By the time Totem and Taboo was published in 1913, America was already setting its own precedents, leading the way in forcible sterilizations of so-called so racial degenerates. The attempt to, quote, improve the genetic lot of humanity had well-funded benefactors like the Carnegie Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation and was rationalized by respected scientists from universities like Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. It's hard to remember that this could have been a very popular concept in, in this day and age. Uh, at the level of universities. Already in 1909, C.B. Davenport, then Secretary of the Committee on Eugenics of the American Breeders Association and the Director of the Carnegie Department of Experimental Evolution at Cold, Harbor, Cold Spring Harbor, was invited to present his views before the American Academy of Medicine at Yale University. The title of the published lecture was, quote, Eugenics, the Science of Human Improvement by Better Breeding, end quote, in 1910. Davenport was pushing for legislation to prohibit marriage and mating between such unfit persons as imbeciles, in quotes, and alcoholics, and he announced that the American Breeders Association had organized a committee on eugenics to investigate, educate, and legislate. The August Committee was composed of such dignitaries as Alexander Graham Bell, V.L. Kellogg, and Adolf Mayer, the first psychiatrist-in-chief of Johns Hopkins Hospital, and the later president of the American Psychiatric Association. Now, Freud, for his part, was certainly on the side of Boaz regarding the issue of race. As we've seen, accusations that his theories reflected a rigid biological or racial determinism are simply incorrect. In Studies in Hysteria, 1895, Freud, with Breuer, had already challenged the widely accepted 19th century hereditarian theories of biological degeneracy, again in quotes, as the cause of hysteria. And Boaz himself certainly had little doubt about Freud's views on the issue of race, when in 1920, he, Boaz, acknowledged that Freud's theories, quote, may be fruitfully applied to ethnology or ethnological problems, because they highlighted the fact that the social behavior of man depends to a great extent upon the earliest habits which are established before the time when connected memory begins, and that many so-called racial or hereditary traits are to be considered rather as a result of early exposure to certain forms of social conditions. This is Boaz, the, the founder of American anthropology, who really, in a sense, um, kicked off the the emphasis of cultural determinism in such a, um, a strong manner in American anthropology, uh, recognizing uh, just how, uh, I guess we could say, nuanced Freud's theory was with regard to culture on the one hand, or um, environmental determinants on the one hand, and biological determinants on the other. This quote by Boaz somehow gets missed in a lot of the, or in the, the major critiques of Freud, as though he had this rigid form of biological determinism um, in, in his theory. But eventually, the very argument that Freud had made against erroneous racial biological determinism, divorced from environmental considerations, was turned on totem and taboo. 
The claim for the Oedipus complex as a universal biological fact of human nature was misrepresented as simple biological determinism and attacked for this reason, among others. And this was certainly reflected in Cardner's critique in 1939, I would propose. On the irony in the neo-Freudian critique, the comparative method, let's return now to Cardner's statement in order to examine another common misrepresentation of Freud's anthropology as it related to the subject of cross-cultural comparisons. Now this is going back to a different part of Cardner's longer quote that I opened up with. Freud never expected that he might be obliged to make comparisons between different types of institutions because the evolutionary hypothesis precluded the, necess the necessity for any such comparisons. End quote. The assertion that Freud's hypotheses precluded comparisons between different types of institutions was yet another instance of irony, given that those very same hypotheses on the part of Freud were under attack already for the, for the opposite charge of relying too heavily on the comparative method of 19th century cultural evolutionism already discussed. Much like Freud's admonitions against wild analysis, Boaz had charted a course for American anthropology in opposition to this comparative evolutionary approach, precisely because it made too many comparisons too easily and on the basis of a priori assumptions about universal evolutionary laws. This is uh, Boaz here on the comparative method. Quote, the comparative studies of which I am speaking here attempt to explain customs and ideas of remarkable similarity which are found here and there, but they pursue also the more ambitious scheme of discovering the laws and history of the evolution of human society. It is clear that this theory has for its logical basis the assumption that the same phenomena are always due to the same causes." End quote. Though that might have been an accurate statement um, on the part of Boaz against the, uh, the abuses of the comparative method, really, of 19th century cultural evolutionism. It's not an easy charge to make against Freud, I'm going to argue. Freud had appropriated British anthropologist E.B. Tyler's concept of survivals, first introduced in his landmark Primitive Culture, 1871. This idea of the continuing persistence into present-day cultures of artifact-like phenomena that had outlived the original conditions in which they had evolved epitomized the older comparative methods that had been disparaged already by the time of totem and taboo. Um, disparaged sometimes uh, for good reason, but, but sometimes not. The concept implied that survivals were like keys to archaic stages in human history, and it was central to many of Freud's most essential anthropological conclusions. Wallace, in 1873, discussed two exemplary quotes that demonstrate the importance of this concept in Freud's thinking. This is Wallace, quote, Indeed, he said, he's referring to Freud, Indeed, he said, it is in the, and this is Freud, psychology of neuroses and not archaeology that one finds more of the antiquities of human development than any other source. That's end quote for Freud. And in the introductory lectures, Freud continued the phylogenetic concerns of totem and taboo. He suggested that with symbolism, we are faced with an ancient but instinct mode of expression. End quote. Freud drew freely from such comparative concepts and was anything but unaware of his obligation to make comparisons between different types of institutions. The subtitle of Totem and Taboo, which was Resemblances Between the Mental Lives of Savages and Neurotics, 
can itself serve as a reminder that anthropologists were critical of him precisely comparing the idiosyncratic rituals of European neurotics with the collective totemic rituals among non-Western Aboriginal tribes. Of course, this was precisely Freud's point in Totem and Taboo, that such comparisons must be made. I would argue that the real problem for critics about the comparisons Freud made was the conclusions he drew from them, not that he was above making comparisons. Freud read prodigiously from the anthropology of his day, and Totem and Taboo drew widely from the ethnographic literature available at the time, especially as it related to the diversity of totemic rituals and marriage customs. This was true, or what was true, was that Freud asserted the conclusions he drew from the comparisons he made as an explicit assault on ethnology. This is uh, something that Freud said himself. Anthropology clearly understood them as such and responded to Freud's assault with their own. After all, if the Oedipus complex was universal, then it helped to explain much of what anthropology was supposed to explain the origin and fu function of culture and civilization, past and present. This was no small challenge to anthropology. On the irony and the matrilineal Oedipus complex. As unlikely as it may seem, perhaps the greatest irony of all occurred when Malinowski's own thesis against the universal Oedipus complex came eventually to be represented by anthropologists and psychoanalysts alike as if it had posited a matrilineal form of the universal and nuclear Oedipus complex. Remarkably, something like wishful thinking began to occur regarding what Malinowski had actually meant in Sex and Repression in Savage Society from 1927. The most authoritative source for nearly half a century of scorn directed against Freud's universal Oedipus complex would, sud would suddenly begin to be framed as though it had been an argument for it all along. An illustration of the cross-disciplinary and authoritative reach of this curious revision and the fate of Malinowski's very non-Oedipal matrilineal complex can be seen in Otto Fenichel's influential psychoanalytic theory of the neuroses in 1945. Fenichel claimed that Malinowski had argued Quote, that societies with family configurations different from our own actually have different Oedipus complexes, end quote. Fenichel was describing here what he claimed to be Malinowski's own conclusion. This was remarkable, as we'll see, given that as far as Malinowski was concerned, the different Oedipus complexes that Fenichel was referring to bore little resemblance to Freud's Oedipal theory. From anthropology, Kroeber, in 1939, had already confused matters six years earlier in his reappraisal of Totem and Taboo published two months after Freud's death. Curiously, he began by saying, quote, I see no reason to waver over my critical analysis of Freud's book. He's referring, he's referring to his first... Um, a critique of Freud. There is no indication that the consensus of anthropologists during these 20 years has moved even an inch nearer acceptance of Freud's central thesis. End quote. Then, in an extraordinary turnaround, he went on to suggest that Malinowski had set out to vindicate Freud's theory by demonstrating what Kroeber considered to be the kernel of the Oedipus situation, which Kroeber, consi which Kroeber cons which consisted, according to Kroeber, of the incest drive and incest repression 
filial ambivalence, and the like. Let me read that over again, because it's a little confusing the way I, I just read it. In an extraordinary turnaround, Kroeber went on to suggest that Malinowski had set out to vindicate Freud's theory by demonstrating what Kroeber considered to be the kernel of the Oedipus situation, which consisted of the incest drive and incest repression, filial ambivalence, and the like, end quote. Actually, it's possible that if Malinowski's own interpretation of his data had found at least these to be true for the Trobrian child between three to five years of age, then at least some of the controversy could have been avoided. But as we'll see, wish as Krober might, Malinowski had not interpreted his own data in this manner. Instead, he convinced two generations of anthropologists and many neo-Freudian psychoanalysts that Troberian boys at this age had no triangular filial ambivalence and no incest drive toward the mother whatsoever, least of all any that could cause murderous fantasies toward the father, unconscious or otherwise. On Malinowski's nuclear complex, in sex and repression in savage society, what Malinowski claimed to have discovered was a different type of a more generally defined nuclear complex, the nature of which had to be determined for each particular society. He says, quote, I have established a deep correlation between the type of society and the nuclear complex found there, end quote. For Malinowski, this could be an Oedipus complex, a matrilineal complex, and at least theoretically any number of other possible versions of nuclear complex. In a remarkable passage in Sex and Repression in Savage Society, Malinowski even appears to have engaged in something of a symbolic patricide of his own when he prophesied the end of British and American patriarchy, and along with it the extinction of an already endangered Oedipus complex. Quote, Psychoanalysis cannot hope, I think, to preserve its Oedipus complex for future generations, who will only know a weak and henpecked father. For him, the children will feel indulgent pity rather than hatred and fear. End quote. It's tempting to imagine something of Malinowski's own Oedipal ambivalence operating in this conjecture of his. But more relevant to our present point, this passage underscores that Malinowski never considered the matrilineal complex to be simply another version of the Oedipus complex based on different customs. On the positions in the Malinowski-Jones debate, a matrilineal form of the Oedipus complex would have been in complete agreement with Freud and is what Oedipal theory would predict. But this was not what Malinowski's thesis, but, but this was not Malinowski's thesis in the debate with Jones. In fact, he could not have been much clearer. I quote him at length here. The complex exclusively known to the Freudian school and assumed by them to be universal, I mean the Oedipus complex, corresponds essentially to our patrilineal Aryan family with the developed patria potestas, buttressed by Roman law and Christian morals, and accentuated by the modern economic conditions of the well-to-do bourgeoisie. Yet this complex is assumed to exist in every savage or, barbar or, or barbarous society. This certainly cannot be correct, and a detailed discussion of the first problem will show us how far this assumption is untrue." End quote. Simply put, there would have been no debate with Jones if Malinowski's thesis had been that the Oedipus complex varies in form according to different social structures. How could there have been? when this was Jones's position in the debate. Not surprisingly, Jones, 
writing in 1924 in this debate with Malinowski was just as clear about Malinowski's position as Malinowski was. Here's Jones. Malinowski's attempts to modify Freud's theory of the nuclear complex, nuclear family complex. Uh, let me start over again. Malinowski attempts to modify Freud's theory of the nuclear family complex. As is well known, the latter regards the relationship, Freud regarded the relationship between father, mother, and son as the prototype from which other more complicated relationships are derived. Malinowski, on the contrary, puts forward the idea that the nuclear family complex varies according to the particular family structure existing in any community." End quote. Jones's position in the debate remained true to Freud's designation of the Oedipus complex as the universal nuclear complex, and Jones correctly showed that Freud's Oedipal theory predicted that Oedipal dynamics stemming from the nuclear triangle would be displaced onto any variety of objects according to the given social structures. Jones argued that, quote, the matrilineal system with its, avon with its avonculate complex, that's referring to the, um, the importance of the maternal uncle in the um, matrilineal society, which Malinowski had claimed was the, was the um, person uh, around whom the nuclear complex in matrilineal societies was focused, the, the, the maternal uncle. Let me start over. The matrilineal system with its avunculate complex arose as a mode of defense. This is Jones again. The matrilineal system with its avunculate complex arose as a mode of defense against the primordial Oedipus tendencies. The forbidden and unconscious, unconsciously loved sister is only a substitute for the mother as the uncle plainly is for the father. We're going to get into this a little bit later when I uh, describe Malinowski's argument a little bit more. Malinowski argued that there wasn't a, an Oedipus complex in matrilineal society, that the, um, that the sexual feelings are primarily at the Oedipal stage for the sister, and they're not repressed and displaced to the sister. They are in their own sort of um, um, unique way. Um, for the sister and the what Freud was saying, uh, the boy feels toward the father, only arises in matrilineal societies, Malinowski said, in relation to the, the uncle. And it wasn't just Jones who clarified the terms of the debate. Roheim also took the same theoretical position against Malinowski's matrilineal complex. In his brilliant The Rise of Anthropological Theory in 1978, Marvin Harris would point out, quote, Contrary to popular impression, in the argument between Roheim and Malinowski over the effect of the Trobrian matrilineal organization on the Oedipal situation, it is Roheim who holds the trump card. By Malinowski's own admission, the Trobrian child is brought up largely under the influence of the usual nuclear pairs. Mother's brother enters the picture only when the child is seven or eight years old, an age by which the Oedipal constellation is firmly entrenched." End quote. Once again, there was no confusion about the sides taken in the debate. The Oedipus complex, as Freud had defined it, was the universal complex, yes or no, and Malinowski said no. It should be clear from the foregoing discussion that Malinowski's argument was never that the nuclear Oedipus complex could manifest in diverse forms according to different customs. Not once in 300 pages of sex and repression in savage society did he refer to anything slightly resembling the reinterpretations that others like Fenichel and Kroger applied to his thesis, such as different Oedipus complexes or matrilineal form of the Oedipus complex. Instead, he refers to the matrilineal complex so entirely, 
quote, the matrilineal complex so entirely different in its genesis and its character from the Oedipus complex, unquote. He exhorts psychoanalysts, quote, not to assume the universal existence of the Oedipus complex, unquote. He claims that with the assumption that the, quote, Oedipus complex exists in all types of societies, certain errors have crept into the anthropological work of psychoanalysts, end quote. He's referring to Rohan here. On Kroeber's caustic reappraisal of 1939, I stressed earlier that only some of the disagreement would have been avoided if Malinowski had interpreted his own data as Kroeber did. In fact, Kroeber's influential reappraisal and redoubled defense of Malinowski following the death of Freud remained negatively inclined toward essential concepts of Oedipal theory, such as the superego. He regarded them as incidental to the Oedipal kernel that he claimed Malinowski had argued for. He suggested that insisting upon such concepts represented fantasy on the part of Freud and psychoanalysis. Well, not surprisingly, this certainly made it difficult for Jones and others to agree with Kroeber that Malinowski had vindicated Freud's Oedipal theory. Kroeber, again in 1939, the year of Freud's death, two, two months after Freud's death, went on to rebuke the Freudians for, all, for their all-or-nothing attitude of, quote, partaking of the nature of a religion, a system of mysticism and possessing the qualities of a delusional system, end quote. All this for insisting that concepts like the superego and the Oedipus complex were defined systematically and could not be theoretically divorced from, from each other. Nonetheless, Kroeber still maintained that Malinowski had really, quote, Malinowski had really vindicated the mechanism of the Oedipal relation. This is, Mal this is Kroeber continuing. Malinowski showed that the mechanism remained operative even in a changed family situation. End quote. Malinowski never thought he was arguing for that. And following Kroeber, subsequent generations of preeminent anthropologists, such as the University of Chicago's Milton Singer, would refer, without questioning the validity of it, to this revisionist idea that Malinowski had argued for a matrilineal form of the Oedipus complex among the Trobrian Islanders. End quote. I don't bring up Milton Singer to primarily criticize him. Milton Singer um, was profoundly important in American anthropology. Um, and really did very important work. I'm bringing this up primarily to emphasize just how widespread this odd revision um, became in both anthropology and psychoanalysis. Um, so on the vindication of the universal Oedipus complex, in retrospect, it seems fair to say that the claim that Malinowski's thesis as opposed to his data, had actually been an argument for a matrilineal form of the Oedipus complex, amounted to at least a partial concession that Freud's claim for the universality of the Oedipus complex had been right all along. With ever more cross-cultural evidence, anthropology did not have much of a choice but to acknowledge this. As Spiro's... Uh, 1982 analysis, Oedipus and the Trobrians, showed, quote, the only appropriate response to the question, is the Oedipus complex universal, is how could it possibly not be? And Spiro goes on to say, if there were a human society where mothers did not have male consorts, so that the son had no adult rival for the love of the mother, in such society, the Oedipus complex, by definition, would not exist. So far as we know, however, no human society of that type exists. 
or has ever existed. End quote. In fact, significant voices in anthropology were contributing to this shift of opinion on the universality of the Oedipus complex by mid-century. Clyde Cleckholm, one of the more influential American anthropologists of the 20th century, published a powerful confession in his contribution to the 1951 <coughs> tribute to the work of, of um, <coughs> uh, Deza Rohan. Falcon described his earlier belief that, quote, psychoanalysis was strongly culture-bound. I was persuaded, for example, that Malinowski's interpretation of the Oedipal situation in the program was substantially correct, end quote. This is quoted in Singer in 1961. But even in the earliest years of his career, Cluckholm acknowledged the powerful influence on his thinking of Roheim and, and psychoanalysis, which would only become more important to him later on. Here is a passage from Cluckholm's famous Confession of 1951, which, given his influence as a major figure in American anthropology in general, and in culture and personality studies in particular, deserves to be quoted at length. Quote, the facts uncovered in my own fieldwork and that of my collaborators have forced me to the conclusion that Freud and other psychoanalysts have depicted with astonishing correctness many central themes in motivational life, which are universal. The underlying psychologic drama transcends cultural differences. This should not be too surprising except to an anthropologist over-indoctrinated with the theory of cultural relativism, for many of the inescapable givens of human life are also universal. Human anatomy and human physiology are, in the large, about the same the world over. There are two sexes with palpably visible differences in external genitalia and secondary sexual characteristics. All human infants, regardless of culture, know the psychological experience of helplessness and dependency. Situations making for competition for the affection of one or both parents for sibling rivalry can be to some extent channeled this way or that way by a culture, but they cannot be eliminated given the universality of family life. The trouble has been because of a series of accidents of intellectual and political history that the anthropologist for two generations has been obsessed with the differences between peoples, neglecting the equally real similarities upon which the universal cultural pattern as well as the psychological universe, uniformities are clearly built." End quote. Kroger's confession amounted to a powerful indictment of anti-evolutionary and anti-psychological models and extreme versions of cultural relativism. His Freudian convictions only strengthened in the last decade of his life following his announcement. Singer observed that Kluckholm only became more explicit in his conviction that the Oedipus complex, in particular, was among the many identifiable cross-cultural universals. As we'll see in greater detail in Lecture 2, Cluckholm was followed, uh, actually it's Lecture, um, maybe Lecture 4, I believe, it's, it's my lecture on the... Uh, uh, cultural evolutionism. As we'll see in that lecture, Cluckholm was followed in the 1950s and 60s by many of the most prominent American anthropologists in reaffirming the theoretical importance of universals and human nature as valid anthropological concepts. These voices included Franz Boaz's most famous students, among them Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, and we had quoted in the last part um, Margaret Mead's famous declaration of the um, 
radical differences between cultures. So these voices included Franz Boas's most famous students, among them Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, who had so effectively implemented Boas's dogmatic emphasis on cultural determinism and historical particularism. In fact, really, um, Boas, in the beginning, as I had said in the first part of this lecture, um, held to a fairly conventional idea of science. It was only later on in his career that he had kind of given up the idea of, of um, what's referred to as nomothetic theoretical formulations, that is, formulations that seek to find generalizations um, uh, that can be applied cross-culturally. In concluding this part of the present lecture on the universal Oedipus complex, it may be helpful to underscore here an essential theoretical point, namely the conceptual difference between a general type of phenomenon, for example, the universal Oedipus complex, as a valid cross-cultural concept, on the one hand, and individual instances or cases which can vary in actuality from the general type. Language, for example, is universal at the societal level, and this fact is not contradicted by the fact that particular individuals do, for any number of reasons, lack the capacity to speak or understand language, or that particular societies may possess more or less differentiated vocabularies, grammatical structures, or means of expressing and vocalizing. The refinement of a general conceptual type in scientific theory is essential for the building and testing of hypotheses about why particular cases vary from that type. Of course, this is the essence of science in general and cross-cultural research in particular. In his affirmation of the universality of the Oedipus complex, Spiro was particularly clear about this distinction. Quote, since at the societal level, it is the biological mother who is the child's central, if not exclusive, early mothering figure, and the biological father its most salient rival for her love in all known societies, it is understandable that the structure of the Oedipus complex, although cross-culturally variable in principle, and certainly in particular cases, is most probably invariant in its structure in fact. Uh, he's meaning cross-cultural. I would argue that Spiro's clarification here of what it means to say that the Oedipus complex is universal is perfectly consistent with Freudian Oedipal theory in its most classical sense. In the next part of the present lecture on the Universal Oedipus Complex, it will be helpful to take a closer look at some specifics of Malinowski's critique in order to adequately address the contemporary context of debate over the claim for a Universal Oedipus Complex, particularly as it's showing up in American psychoanalysis in America. Um, where the Oedipus complex continues to be uh, minimized, if not deprecated. So that's where we'll pick up next.